My name is Asma Kazmi, and um, I am really excited to, um, to introduce our speaker today, Naiza Khan. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to say a little bit about myself. I'm an artist and a professor in the art practice department. Um, um, and um, I'm also the co-director of the South Asia Art Initiative with my colleague Atri Gupta. Thank you so much for coming to this talk, which is hosted by the South Asia Art Initiative, uh, which is part of the Institute of South Asia Studies at Berkeley. This event is part of the Crisis and Creativity Artists Speak series, which is a new speaker series that addresses provocative and generative intersections between creative processes and societal, cultural, and environmental crises. The series features conversations among artists, curators, and scholars. Um, I would like to add that this event is co-sponsored by the Art History Department, the Department of Art Practice, and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, I'm really thrilled to introduce our speaker, Naiza Khan, today. Naiza Khan is an influential force in the Pakistani art world and a leading contemporary artist. I first met Naiza 14 years ago in Karachi when she generously opened up her beautiful home and artist studio to me. More recently, I got to experience Naiza's powerful installation at the Venice Biennale which was assembled from a rich and non-linear research-based approach. In this work, Naiza weaved together images, objects, and sounds, which invoked the ghostly ecology of the colonial and post-colonial economic shipping and transport inf infrastructure of Manora, an island not too far from Karachi. Naiza's visual practice is built on a process of critical research, documentation, and mapping-based exploration. Through a range of media, including drawing, archival material, and video, she brings together ideas of embodiment and ecology. Her work looks at geography as a heterogeneous assemblage of power, colonial history, and collective memory. Working with the materiality of space, Naiza Khan's multidisciplinary practice raises questions about optics, erasure, and friction between old and new infrastructure. Naiza Khan trained at the Ruskin School of Art at the University of Oxford. Her practice encompasses teaching, curation, and writing. In 2000, she co-founded the Vessel Artist Collective which is an important organization that provides collaborative opportunities for Pakistani artists nationwide and internationally. She's currently a senior advisor in the visual studies department at the University of Karachi. Um, Naiza Khan has curated several exhibits of contemporary Pakistani art, including the rising tide at the Mahatta Palace Museum in Karachi. Her work has been widely exhibited internationally, including the Lahore Biennial, um, the, art, the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, the Kochi Biennial, and the Shanghai Biennial. Um, in 2019, um, Naiza Khan represented Pakistan at the inaugural pavilion of Pakistan at the 58th Venice Biennale. She has received numerous awards and residencies, including the Prince Claus Award, um, the, a residency at the Institute of Contem Contemporary Modernities at Cornell University, the Raybone Art Center in Tehran, and Gasworks in London. Um, Naiza Khan is currently a research candidate at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths at the University of London, and she works between London and Karachi. Please join me in warmly welcoming Naiza Khan. Thank you very much, Asma. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, it takes me back to 2011, a decade ago, when I came to Berkeley 
on the invitation of Sabah Mahmood and I really treasure that uh, experience. Um, it's great to be back and, and sharing new works with you. Uh, thank you very much to the sponsors of this series and to Panita and yourself. Um, I'd like to share my screen so that I can start some images and show you a little bit of what I've been doing in the recent few years. And I'm just going to do that if you bear with me. Great. Wonderful. We keep practicing these small movements and techniques and I think we'll get there. Um, it was a challenge to um, actually put this lecture talk together because I put myself into a spot by calling it walking across disciplines. And um, as I was uh, thinking through my work, I felt um, in the last year, I've shared my work across many platforms and institutions. And I felt kind of bored talking about my work in the same way. And so I think I set myself the challenge to think about the work, but through a different lens. Perhaps um, I hope that comes across. One of the things that I realized through my practice in Karachi was the way in which I had to cross into arenas and workspaces which were unfamiliar. And this could be because Karachi is a city where you have to find affiliations with creatives and intellectuals who are not necessarily working within the visual space. And so I was thinking this time very much about my practice as a walking practice, because I realized over the last 10 years, I'd been revisiting the same sites, exploring the same architectural phenomena, the same ruins, found objects, and really looking at the nature of public space that surrounds these sites. So walking the city has become a way for me in a sense to reclaim public space as a woman. And also it becomes a critique of the gender divided, ethnically fractured cities that we often um, witness, not just in South Asia, but across the world now. And so this process of walking was in a sense for me about creating a visual archive and also thinking about um, the narratives that we um, have, that we want to build and we want to recreate about certain terrains. So I'd like to um, talk to you about three projects. Each of them are really very different, but I think what connects them is this idea of walking, of traversing, and about finding knowledge in that process, perhaps. And I will give you a short uh, background to the first project, which is Hundreds of Birds Killed. And um, this project comes out of a body of work that spans the last 10 years, focusing on Menorah Island, which is located in the Karachi Harbor, as Asma mentioned. So from about the 18th century onwards, Menorah served as a defense outpost facing the Arabian Sea. And it has many sites of worship, the Sri Varun Dev Mandir, St. Paul's Church, and the shrine of Yusuf Shah Ghazi, amongst others. So it kind of points to a very diverse, multi-religious history of pre-partition South Asia. And over the past decade, I've kind of witnessed the slow erasure of this island's architectural history, but also its natural ecology. So these transformations kind of bear witness to other sites also in the global south and across the world, which are kind of un undergoing similar transformations of um, environmental degradation and social and economic justice, and also mass displacement. Menorah Island witness is a witness to all the things that it was and is, a colonial port, a naval base after World War II, a failed holiday resort project, 
and a space for non-elite leisure from the dense urban life in Karachi. But to me, menorah also evokes the metaphor of a body that has been gutted and cast away. So um, as I was trying to find ways to articulate uh, both a personal and collective experience, I really thought all of this comes out of a very intuitive sense of mapping. This image is not of Menorah Island, but um, is, is shot from an apartment which is uh, located just on the um, shoreline where there's a lot of um, development of a deep sea terminal, the seven deep sea terminals that were built in the last six, seven years along, along Karachi's coastline, really to um, develop the, the global port of Karachi. So I was thinking about ways of working, about research and field work, and also in this process about different kinds of knowledge pools, and also my role as a visual artist. And in this process, I, I think drawing for me was a very core activity, which also became a process of walking, almost like plotting lines across the physical terrain of the island with my body from one point to another and creating a memory or a dialogue. And so this experience was also an experience of learning and unlearning the space of this island and also the city. And one thing I would like to add is that the local and the locale that I was working in was really important throughout this process because um, in a sense, um, I was finding ways of um, how the material culture is lived and experienced, um, and also the ritualistic kind of process of, of that, that experience. So um, I guess um, perhaps I won't talk too much about the archives because that is something I'm going to mention when I talk about hundreds of birds killed, but um, this was one of the first um, documents I found in the Menorah Observatory. It's, it's an ad for communication equipment, the Marconi ad, from a 1966 nautical almanac. Um, and really, this is important because it informed my thinking on vision, and it also allowed me to supplement a kind of theoretical twisting of space and time with a physical one. And if you see the drawing in my sketchbook on the right-hand side, it sort of cemented my relationship between drawing and optical devices, which I'm very interested in. Um, the island space really gave me a sense of um, getting out of my studio, looking at uh, different forms of knowledge, uh, people that I could speak to along the path of walking, um, but also interdisciplinary sources of reading, conversations with urban scholars, and also dialogues with the establishment because the island has a naval installation since the Second World War. So for me, it became a little bit, this research became a sort of observation point for many things that I'm thinking about right now in relationship between, uh, the relationship between the local and the global. Um, I'm going to show two drawings uh, before I jump into the project of hundreds of birds killed. And the first one is um, developed out of um, accounts of scenes from a soldier's life from 1848. A British soldier describes the sandstorms in Karachi during the mid 19th century. And so in different ways, these archival accounts touched on important and overlooked um, parts of my understanding of, of, of where I lived and also what shaped its geography. So really jump, sort of delving into these archives was a way to kind of understand the present moment that I was I was living in and experiencing. And it also led me to speculate on the cyclical overlapping identities of climate in all its tangible and intangible forms, marking the land, 
in a sort of continuous and relentless cycle. The second uh, drawing is um, a dust storm. And again, it sort of, um, sort of marks my interest in the no this sort of idea of the atmosphere, the idea of our relationship, our fraught relationship with climate change and global warming, but also um, really, you know, how we negotiate this um, as, as, as city dwellers and on an individual level as communities. Lastly, just to mention that um, the Venice project, as Asma uh, said earlier, um, consists of three parts. Um, and one part is a filmic installation titled Sticky Rice and Other Stories, um, which is a film in two parts. It's an installation in two parts. It traces a mental map of the region around Karachi. And on one hand, it recalls Manora Island's past as a colonial outpost uh, for the British. And on the other, the role of global, the Global South port in a new geopolitical order marked by the New Silk Route and the China economic um, corridor. So from colonial textile trade to containerized cargo shipping, it sort of kind of spans um, these ideas. Um, so, the project um, of hundreds of birds killed originates in a 1939 archival weather report on storms and depressions in colonial India. And um, it also really, uh, so this was the starting point. Um, and at this point, I was also really interested in how um, there was this attempt to predict the monsoon in India around the mid 19th century onwards. And all of this was wrapped up in uh, capital and enterprise. Uh, and so there was this obsessiveness in dealing with uh, the losses along the biometric readings and wind force and the reports that revealed, um, you know, this link between natural and fiscal storms. So the taxonomy of weather was something that I was really interested in. And also this um, sense of how, um, you know, these locations, these cities, uh, these moments of, of weather memory became uh, a sort of archive about the land itself uh, through a kind of lived experience. So I selected 11 cities from this report, uh, which were part of the British Empire between um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And these 11 cities were developed as um, a series of scaled brass maps. Um, I'm going to just add a few images of the maps. Um, this is a map of Calcutta. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the maps uh, and I'd like to show a short film about the making of these objects, which I hope you find um, kind of take you into another process of, of how I was kind of walking through this space of um, Karachi trying to think about um, how do these archives connect to the city I live in, but also to kind of larger questions and um, of, of, of global and climate change. So um, this is a very brief um, description or, and, and film about, about the work and the process of casting 86 tiles uh, and how they were produced. Ten years ago, I began to work with Shahid Bhai and his brothers, who are part of a community of artisans in Godimar, a neighborhood in North Karachi. Shahid Bhai is the second generation of casters who came from a town called Muradabad, north of Delhi. As an artist, I'm deeply invested in the materiality of the work and to learn how the materials respond and to connect with this community who are part of a long history and tradition of making. 
It was difficult to control the slippage of liquid brass and to predict how each piece would sit together to make up the whole. The resistance and consistency of molten metal and its fragility produced outcomes that I did not anticipate. Gondia, CP, 24th February, heavy hailstorm. Fields and tiles of roofs of houses damaged. Glass panes and railway carriages broke. Motihari, Darbhanga and Muzaffarpur districts, Bihar, 24th February, heavy hailstorm and gale. Many persons killed in Papdi Thana, 15 in Benipati Thana, 4 in Singeshwarstan Mela. Thousands of people rendered homeless, many injured, several houses demolished. Large area in Kanpur district, 1st March. Afternoon, hailstorm, much damage to crops, hundreds of birds killed. So, um, with many cartographic exercises, the methodology used to create the series of maps was initially informed by how I could accurately transpose GIS data, data into physical representations of the 11 cities selected out of the report. And what emerged through the intensive process of conceptualizing and producing this work were differences in the technologies of production. So there were dichotomies between the long established artisanal processes and overlap of traditional cartography and also the rapidly evolving software and satellite mapping. I think uh, for me also the sound was a disruptive uh, uh, sort of element which um, uh, was disrupting the kind of weather, the, the map of the weather and uh, the disaster and the uneven sacrifice of human capital that links colo colonialism and neoliberal economy. Um, so what was really a very much an organic process um, through the hand casting of brass um, also created a set of questions about erasure, about scale and distance. And this transformation from the digital and spherical to the final tangible and planar forms of the hand cast brass maps required my team, which was based in Karachi, Berlin, and London to navigate many different kinds of methods of fabrication um, and processes that you know each each team didn't really uh, necessarily um, understand, but we had to kind of all learn each other's skills uh, in order to bring um, all of this together. Um, this is uh, the these are installation shots from the Venice Biennale, and um, and um, just to say that the objects um, which you see um, were, were cast um, as about 300 objects um, taken from the list of the weather report of things that had been dis dismantled, dislodged because of the, of the storm. And then these were bought in secondhand markets around um, Karachi near the Empress Market and welded together after casting, almost like um, three-dimensional drawings for me. And this is uh, an installation shot from the Lahore Biennale um, from 2020. Um, I won't say too much more about this and perhaps we can come back to this um, in the Q&A. But really uh, what I felt was really important in this process was the kind of emotive and intuitive quality 
um, that came out of the sound piece and also the way that I could um, excavate, uh, you know, the text uh, through images and through uh, a kind of multiple uh, sort of form and source to, to fit the narrative together. And so there was a kind of shift of scale from finding this weather report and then tracing it through this process of uh, production. And I realized that, um, you know, there were many linkages and and unscripted and unresolved um, uh, ideas between all of these uh, shifts of scale and um, narratives of scale. And um, it's just something that, um, you know, I, I work, I feel I work um, best with trying to explore and, 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 and find ways to, um, I mean, these three drawings in a sense explain what I'm trying to say with the sense of sort of points or within clusters of, of certain um, thought processes that, that kind of move between my sketchbook and, 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 um, and the actual sort of uh, larger scale of works that I produce. So um, coming to the second project, um, really, um, I think a lot of us uh, during lockdown through the long year of 2020 have been working and trying to find ways of producing work. And um, I, I, I think I was very fortunate to be doing a postgraduate research program at Goldsmiths College. And my peers and I were discussing how we could continue our research, especially our field work under restrictive travel and lockdown conditions. So Walking in Common is an ongoing project, which, which is quite experimental and it's been produced and developed under the condition of COVID and lockdown over the past year. Um, just to say that um, this program at the Center for Research Architecture um, really gave me a sense of community uh, and a way of working collectively um, and thinking about new research methods, which um, was a real sort of saving point, I suppose, during this long COVID um, and lockdown uh, that we've all experienced. Um, I would say from the onset that uh, this is a pilot project. It's very speculative. It's a performative gesture on my part to find ways to spatialize my research. So it was an extension of my research. It wasn't, it's not the actual sort of research paper that I'm producing. And um, Walking in Common, it's a series, it's a series of podcasts from the field developed as a chain of creative collaborations with different practitioners. Through this process, I was trying to explore how we can create um, a complex field site of situated knowledge from different geographies and from archival texts and from memory. Um, it's also um, a particular, uh, it's also an attempt to put the voice of Parveen Rahman in conversation with other voices and other practitioners, um, a journalist, a scholar, an artist. And it's an attempt to think together on issues of social justice uh, and environmental justice. Parveen Rahman, um, I'll speak about um, in a minute, but really uh, if you, um, if you, there, there, there are a number of um, uh, things to uh, mention here. So at the, at the basis of this uh, research, um, at, at the center of this research um, is the pedagogic learning of Parveen Rahman and others, Akhtar Hamid Khan, Arif Hassan. Um, Parveen was an urban scholar who worked with both of, of these people who established the Orangi pilot project. She's an environmental activist who was killed in Karachi in February, 2013. And really at the heart of the Orangi pilot project is the question of land security, dispossession and belonging. Orangi is um, a township uh, situated in the periphery of Karachi and has about 1.5 million people, over 1.5 million people living in it. 
And for me, it was interesting because um, this uh, Orangi offers a spatial imaginary with several uh, frameworks. It's a settlement formed with migrants, climate refugees, and huge movements of people between urban and rural spaces. So something that Parveen Rahman said in one of her um, lectures at the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights in Bangkok was the fact that the map is like an X-ray for the body, an X-ray that you have to look at in order to see what the problem is in order to solve it. So she was involved in a process of mapping from the bottom up, from the community and from the lanes of this settlement um, in order to create uh, environmental literacy and also to locate herself in the context of Orangi um, because she was an outsider. So she developed this method of the walking map, um, which is something that I based my, um, my, um, my exhibition project on. And it was during lockdown and the dislocation from real time spaces, face-to-face -face conversations that I myself began to go for long walks. In a sense, I began to time travel and to think about how I could spatialize my research. And over this period of time, I'd been talking to friends, having informal conversations and interviews around the idea of mapping. And these conversations and these people became part of my creative bubble. And from their practice and scholarly work, I developed this um, experiment, I suppose. Um, and I began to storyboard a series of podcasts, a set of punctuations that in a sense put the voice of Parveen Rahman in conversation with others. And to do this, I had to mediate the conversation. So I set up a series of guidelines, a set of guidelines for collaboration, which was really a provocation um, to ask people uh, to rethink and reimagine their work in relation to uh, Rahman's work. And in this way, I began to draw a map to situate each participant in a geographical location. Um, and also to think about the kind of multiple complexities that underscore such collaborations and chains of creative production. So the guidelines included the location or locality that the person was in, um, to think about whether they were in, in an industrial site, a ruin, a street crossing or a historical building, and to describe that space and the texture of that place. The second thing was to think about the sensory, what time of day it was, what was the light, what was the sense of the atmosphere, the temperature, the humidity, and to record some kind of ambient sound if possible while they were walking. Um, the third was to respond um, in a sense to, in a, in a sensory and critical way and to think about um, where they were as a sort of situated testimony. Um, and also just to simply uh, situate themselves within the space that they were walking in relation to their own ideas and their own research. The last was the condition and how did they respond under the situation of the pandemic? How did, they, how did this condition make them rethink their practice? Uh, what were the kinds of coping mechanisms that they developed? Um, and I think that all of us in each city have had to deal with different, have to navigate uh, the lockdown in different ways, the limitations of movement, the surveillance, um, greater policing, and also just the imbalance of, of, of the racial statistics um, that, that we, we sense out of this um, experience of COVID. So um, as I was saying to um, Asma earlier, this is a difficult project to share across Zoom. And I think, uh, and I hope that, you know, uh, a little bit of what I was trying to do comes out. Um, I think, um, you know, this idea of friendships, uh, affinities, 
thinking locationally, thinking about, um, in a sense, unlearning geographies through this exchange to this creative network uh, was something that I was um, that I was uh, thinking about and was hoping to um, get each collaborator to locate their practice within this kind of tenuous and an instable set of connections. And um, I'm not going to play all the um, podcasts, but you can find the link in the chat. And I think Asma might have uh, put it through. But for me, this was a very generative process to think about um, using sound as a way to archive relationships, different imaginaries. And um, I'm going to play a, a short extract by um, Christopher Cozier, who's an artist based in uh, Port of Spain. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to, to play a little section of this. I'm sorry that it's a little unclear, um, but you know you might get the gist of, of what, what he's saying. And um, give me a second. Let's see how this can work. Um, right. I'll meet you on the corner of so and so and so and so. They would say to you, I'll meet you by where the guy is selling nuts is. But the guy selling nuts is not a permanent person. So they think we have different mappings, you know, so people talk about, and when I was, and then took me back to my childhood, because there were different mentally disturbed people that occupied different parts of the city. And you would, you would describe the location and where you pass based on completely different markers. You know, from shop signs to um, where some vagrant or, or you call the name of some character. And uh, so it really talked about how you navigated the space as opposed to the formal, structured, institutional. Because you said something when you were talking to me. I was reading something recently online by an Indian scholar. I'll share it with you after. He was talking about the predicament of post-colonial studies outside of the West. And he was making comparisons between Nandi, himself, Spivak, and people like that. But he, the things that struck me that I never thought of, he talked about in the context of India, um, particularly around the Babri massive concern and the road to that, that a lot of the anxieties around difference manifested it, itself with colonial census taking. Nobody was counting before these practices manifested. How many, you know, Muslims, how many Hindu, you know, in, in these parts of the country and so on. But once these census surveys took place, they became the platform for this kind of commodification, political commodification. Coming from my generation, yeah, I'm a, I grew up in Trinidad, and my predicament is particularly odd because I'm a brown person, uh, African and European, but I could be mistaken for Indian. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess... Um... One more section of, of another podcast. Um, but just to say that um, I think what happened for me during this process was a kind of defiguring of the contours of um, my research. And I was beginning to create these um, connections between um, different um, locations, but also different modes of working uh, between the artists, the investigative journalist, the scholar. And um, it was kind of a critique of, of how we think about geography as well, uh, as a kind of from a very fixed position. Um, I'd like to play a short section of this next podcast, which is 
Amina Yakin, who's a professor of Urdu and post-colonial studies at SOAS. And uh, she talks about mapping in relationship to the poet Femi Daryaz. And this is also a very um, interesting podcast. So I'd really encourage you all to, to log in when you're um, sitting around and, and would like to listen to a podcast. So I'll just play a little section of this as well. person I think whose work speaks to Parveen's work is the poet Fahmida Riaz who I've worked on and um, whose work embodies that landscape of Karachi quite a lot. You know, you can hear it in her work, uh, in, in the poetry that she writes, in the prose that she writes. You've got those kind of intense landscapes that inform her work and also that um, resistance to oppression and hegemony that is that is so central to what um, Bervin Rahman is doing as well. If I spoke about those questions through her work, so so I can some some of her energies as a walker through the city and, and talk to you about that. Because we're talking about this from from London, so I thought let's let's locate ourselves first. And Femi Darias also came to London when she was married first. Uh, she had an arranged marriage, uh, the first marriage. And she, um, she, she was going to film school here and she has a poem that is very interesting because it's a poem about walking and it's a poem about walking in the city in the dark and it's about a woman going home. And I thought this is something that is is actually quite um, global and it's also quite local because it's that um, feeling that you have when you're walking home of this um, fear and also it's a sense of alienation and being not in a place that is home that is familiar and with her it's quite interesting because she's a migrant she's a mohajir so she is also a migrant in karachi she's not born in karachi she comes from a different, from meerut in india and okay thank you so much for <clears throat> bearing up with all the different sound and shifts of images so to come to the last project um, that i'd like to share and i i'll take another maybe 5 minutes um, and then perhaps we can open up some questions, Asma. Uh, so in March this year, I experienced my first virtual artist residency, which coincides with the opening of the online exhibition, Monsoonal Multiplicities, a platform that presents the project's five year long research engagement with the monsoon in Bangladesh, India, London, and Myanmar. <clears throat> So um, what was really exciting to see in this platform was how the research team used methods and techniques drawn from a number of disciplines, from anthropology, history, the spatial design disciplines, the natural sciences, critical cultural theory, and ecofeminism, and many more. And in this way, the, the project offered methods and approaches of investigating weather, climate, and more than human becomings in urban monsoonal worlds. So in other words, it was a very transdisciplinary uh, process um, and a very long process of research, I would say. One of the things that stood out for me um, was the way that the scientific imaginary is in conversation with the everyday, the lived experience of the monsoon in the cities of Chennai, Dhaka and Yangon. As an artist, um, as artists in this residency, we were invited to inhabit the space of this research platform for two weeks and use our visual practice to develop work that would engage with the research and also address the question, how is London a monsoonal city? Which was really quite a challenge in the beginning. And as a starting point, I began to create a series of mind maps and to think about the entanglement of London in the engineering of weather in South Asia. So during the 19th century, with the growing importance of India to the British Empire, there was a growing desire to predict the monsoon. 
engineers and investors both sought to turn the uncertainty of the monsoon into calculable risk. And so you see infrastructures that change the landscape in South Asia through dams and canal systems. And this brought me back to London to think about how the city was the nerve center of the decisions and developments that were enacted upon um, during that time. And at the same time, I was also thinking about London's hydrology, its flood defense, and also um, you know, what kinds of structures were being developed here um, alongside the developments in South Asia. <clears throat> One of the things I did in the beginning was to reframe this question to create a thought experiment. How do you measure a cloud? And I did this in order to reimagine uh, you know, a way to enter uh, this rather complex question of, of the monsoon in London and to ask um, and perhaps to sort of bring it into scale that we could consider it ourselves individually as well. How do you measure a cloud? And how do you measure the risk of a monsoon cloud? And what kind of things does this reveal? So, um, you know, this was really a very um, initial um, seeding of ideas. It was a very, um, it was really the beginning of, um, of starting something that was, was very interesting for me, uh, but also a, a kind of a new experience of inhabiting a space of research, which has already been um, sort of developed and defined to some extent. Um, one of the things that I realized from this platform was the critical dialogue it developed between cities and communities, um, and also about how we can learn from the global south. So these mind maps kind of evolved into a series of um, water maps. And um, I worked a lot with the medium of water, but this was a new experience. And the last image that I'm going to show you is a, again, a one minute um, moving image, uh, which records the process of working um, on the map, creating kind of this relationship between um, the, the process of, of, of painting, but also the ideas that are generated out of, um, out of the um, uh, ideas that I was thinking and, and researching at this time. So there are two things um, in this process. Um, I'd been thinking about the movement of people across time and space, and especially the history of indentured labor that took place between the end of slavery in America um, in 1838 up to 1917. And under colonial rule, India's population provided the British empire with a ready source of cheap labor and mobile labor. Um, so this final image brought me back uh, to thinking about the legacy of London um, as a center of the transatlantic um, uh, project of indentured labor where about um, over 200,000 immigrants were shipped uh, in 245 ships, uh, which made 534 voyages across the Kalapani during this time. And um, I'll end with this short video and I hope um, it comes out clearly. There's, there's not really much sound, but I hope you can see the image clearly. Oops. Let me see. Um, try that again. Okay. okay. Um, let me just uh, go back. Okay. So we had to have a little glitch and here it is. So coming to the final image, I will see if I can put that on. You get a quick snapshot of everything that you missed. Okay. Um, here we go. Try again.
thank you um, very much for indulging me and sorry for going a bit over time. Um, I'd love to field any questions or comments or suggestions. Thank you so much, Niza, for so generously walking us through some of your recent work. Um, it's really exciting to hear about it. Um, please um, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, Niza, as people type up their questions and comments, maybe I can I can start with a question about research. Um, you know, I was thinking in other fields, um, academics and scientists, when they um, do research, they're they're trying to prove a theory or test um, test an idea. Um, but you know, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you were talking about walking as a kind of research and a way to um, find knowledge, um, which sounds to me like a, a, a kind of non-linear, promiscuous way of um, engaging with um, with the city, but also with you know thinking about research. So I was wondering if, like, how how do you settle on an image or um, you know a, a, a text um, or um, some sound, how, how do you know what you're looking for um, as, you, as you walk through the city? Thanks, um, Asma. Um, I think um, you keep picking up things as you walk. And I think the fact that um, one is not in a fixed location, but moving, um, that allows me to um, kind of pick up many things. And, and I think for a while, <clears throat> at least um, at the beginning of the Menorah project, I was quite, um, I, I, I think I was quite um, perplexed about the kinds of things that I was picking up. I didn't really recognize this way of working. Um, it took almost a year to make sense of the fact that yeah, I had a set of photographs, which were very specific. I had watercolors and drawings in my studio. Um, I was having conversations with urban scholars, um, with people in the community. And, you know, all of these different kind of pools of knowledge, um, as you said, they were not linear. Um, and it took a little bit of time to think about how they connect and where they overlap and, you know, how they kind of build the, you know, how I was building a cartography in a sense of that of a specific place. Um, so I think um, the answer to your question is uh, that it was in not knowing um, how I was um, setting this up that enabled me to you know, build a structure or a kind of fluid um, method um, to, to, to kind of understand what was going on because also, I didn't understand what this place was about, what, uh, what it was revealing to me. Um, and, you know, I think that um, in creative practice, um, you often don't, you, you often don't put words to things before you um, theorize them. I mean, other people theorize it, right? And um, as a practitioner, you sort of, you, you sort of want to hold on to the ground that you're walking on, and I, and in a literal sense, in a metaphorical sense. So I, I would say that that's um, that's what you have to trust. Yeah, I um, I love thinking about time as a as a way to sort of process all the the information that you collect. Um, you know, my experience of. Um, walking through your installation at the Venice Biennale, it was, it was actually a really powerful um, experience for me because you, you managed to sort of show me, um, you know, Manora and, 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 and Karachi in a, in a, in a new way, um, even though, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm really familiar with that space. So that was really powerful. And I, you know, I'm also wondering about storytelling in your work, um, walking through the exhibit. I, I felt like you gave me um, it, it just enough as a, you know, a kind of economy of hints for me to take the work forward. Um, and, um, you know, so how, how do you make those decisions about what to place next to 
um, you know, another object, um, how to link spaces um, in, in these sort of installation forms. Um, how do you tell a story? Um, I think the uh, hundreds of birds killed was, was um, something that came together very much centered on the archival weather report. Um, and I, I think, you're, you know, it's a really interesting question because um, the Venice project came together very fast. And so there was not a lot of time to, um, I think a lot of the, the connections evolved as we went stalling and afterwards. And, you know, it was amazing to see for me how this telescope, which was in the middle of, um, uh, in the courtyard between the film installation and the installation of sound and maps was sort of placed in a way that you would see this idea of uh, the twisting of space as you know as I mentioned uh, in in the middle of my um, you know talking about the work um, and I think that um, for the project in Venice each of the works were quite independent um, and yet you know I, I termed it menorah field notes because I wanted to pay homage to this, this one specific place, but at the same time, try to kind of stretch out this idea that, you know, many things have, many questions have, have come out of this one particular geographical location, which are unraveling over time um, and in different mediums. Um, so I think this idea of storytelling was very important. Um, uh, and it was really important to anchor the viewer into uh, the specificity of my 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 geography, um, and I think um, you know in a sense that weather report for me was this kind of sense also of discovering that you find stories in archives and you find sort of this very animated narrative of 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 social life, I suppose, through something which, um, you know, kind of um, collates weather data uh, through a colonial lens. But at the same time, you realize that all these things happening against which, you know, the, the tabulation of weather is also kind of a kind of driving force. So, you know, that that was really a generative uh, experience to, to, to kind of engage in that for such a long time and to kind of really, really unpack those narratives, I think, um, yeah. Thanks so much, Niza. Um, I'll, I'll read some of the questions from the audience. Um, so um, Sana Sabuwala um, would like to know how the process of walking um, guides your work and if it impacted your idea of what constitutes the local. Um, yeah, I think um, this notion of walking is something I've been thinking about more recently. And I think um, I realized how important it was, this kind of spine of, of the fact that I was revisiting places again and again. And, you know, um, the, the, the temple, um, you know, the, the ruins in the island. And I was kind of wondering to myself, why am I coming back to this place each time? Um, and I think, um, so yeah, walking was a really uh, important way of, um, of kind of um, researching the space, um, but also it kind of, I think also foregrounded what was going to come next. I mean, this kind of sense of how um, um, you know conversations with residents or the community evolved um, and and so this was really really um, yeah it was very much a kind of process of drawing something um, you know onto the to the to the geography of a particular location and um, and and trying to yeah figure things out connect things yeah. Thanks so much, Niza. Um, Alia Bilgarami um, um, would like to know, let's see, 
Um, she, she found the video at the end very intriguing. Um, is it a clip from a longer film? Um, um, thanks, Alia. Um, this, uh, I created three short videos and each one, I kept it a minute. Uh, so the three images you see of the water maps um, are still images in, in the first two instances, and the third one, you see the moving um, image. Um, I kept them really short. Um, and I want, I, I, I filmed the process of painting each map and flooding the paper. Um, and then I edited it into a one minute um, document um, and kind of moved it in speed as well as you can see. So yeah, the, it's not part of a longer film, but I'm really thinking about that. I'm thinking about how the last one can expand, how I would like to work with sound as well um, and how I can kind of, you know, make it grow into something a little longer. Definitely, I think I, I kept it short because I wanted to hold the attention of the viewer and not um, make it too long. But I, 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 I feel also that it's a longer, it should be a longer, slower um, move it, moving image work. And, and a little more, you know, um, I mean, I, I like the way that the words of the, the, the vessels and the year that I've placed into the, into the video, how, how they are kind of erased as I move my hand. Um, and that kind of mixing of that archival information and, and, and the, the process of, you know, my hand erasing and painting and, and, and flooding the papers is really interesting, something that I'd like to think about. So yeah, it's very tentative. I mean, it was a two week residency, which, um, you know, we had, there were so many ideas and something to follow up on for sure. Um, Naisa, um, Shireen Ahmed, hi Shireen, um, would like to know if uh, the Menorah project has changed anything for the people living there. Thank you, Shireen. That's a really good question. Um, I don't think it's changed anything on the ground because, um, you know, there is a, um, a, a motion of things that um, are happening in, in, in the urban space in Karachi that I don't think can be arrested. I mean, there is a kind of um, a motion of, of, of weathering, which it can't be stopped. There's also the kind of uh, way that the island space is, is being um, transformed. Um, it feels like I, it would be like the story of David and Goliath trying, you know, me trying to sort of arrest the changes that are inevitable. Um, I think what's interesting is that a lot of people uh, know about Menorah through the work. I mean, people within the city of Karachi who perhaps never visited the island have said, you know, Naisa, I went there because I saw your work or I saw something, an image or a photograph. Um, and a lot of people outside um, Pakistan know about um, this island and, and sort of it becomes a, a kind of entry point into, into the city and, and the kind of issues that we deal with. Um, so um, I don't really think that it's changed that much. I suppose the people that I've engaged with, it's been interesting for them to think of, you know, this woman who comes back again and again to have conversations, to, to, to kind of meet, to talk, uh, to collaborate on things. Um, perhaps it's changed some perspective of what they feel about the island and what they're doing. Um, so that's been perhaps um, something um, to hold on to. Um. Naisa, the next question is from the Timatur. Um, she thanks you and she says that you traverse so much ground from historical archives and field studies that reflect our collective past to cities and ecologies ravaged by weather to your earlier work on the contours of the body, especially the female form and notions of femininity. Materiality is so important, but there is also a deeper message and narrative. Do you internalize that message or narrative yourself first and then create the work that reflects your experience? Thank you so much, um, 
Dipti, that's a, a beautiful question. Um, something I'll think about. Um, to, I, I think uh, internalizing the process is really important for me. So my work really evolves very slowly. And um, I always think of my work in cycles of maybe five years or more. Um, I produce quite, you know, I, I produce quite slowly. Um, and I think um, that's, that's something about creative practice that I think a lot of artists perhaps feel. Um, I, I think the both the internalization and the actual work, uh, the creation of work happens uh, side by side, I would say. Um, and, and I think that um, it's about kind of putting one foot forward and then the other. And so it kind of creates a kind of, it's a meshed together in a sense, the experience of, of making the work, which produces questions um, and also the kind of way that um, you try to kind of consolidate what you're doing and find the path forward. So I think, I think it's, it's something that um, uh, I would say um, is happening simultaneously both the production as well as the kind of uh, conceptualization. I, I, I certainly don't conceptualize something um, in, its, in its whole and then start working on it. I don't think I ever do that. I, I mean, I often talk about my processes not knowing what's going to happen next. So um, not knowing what's going to be on the piece of paper or the canvas. Um, and I think that's that's exciting for me. That's the that's the way I I find my work um, stays um, urgent for me. Um, Eliza, I'm gonna read um, the next question. I was I was trying to think about um, how to understand this, but maybe we can um, we can try to work on it together. So. Um, um, an attendee asks, can you say a bit more about welding together of local knowledges um, slash experiences of things like compression or density with a cartographic image Im Im imaginary, um, which is perhaps scopic in ways we are taught to critique. Um, exa example, the drone, um, I.L. Wiseman's thinking of relations of horizontal horizontality and verticality as a distinct form of neocolonial occupation. Um, can you say more about welding as a form of disarticulation or of assemblage? Sure. Um, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, this, this, um, this whole installation of maps was interesting because I realized as I installed it that it's a very aerial view of of the cities that I'd um, selected or you know pulled out of the, the report and so there was a certain kind of optics that was being created which um, which was uh, in a sense um, interesting because it was excavated from um, you know, the kind of a spatial digital um, GIS mapping through open street maps and visualized as a kind of um, flat, um, you know, density of lines, rivers, roads. And then this process of casting, which was very analog in a sense, it was very, it was full of um, problems. Uh, there was a lot of spillage of the liquid metal. So I think that um, this kind of idea of uh, the optics that was being created um, on one level um, was, was, was interesting because of the processes through which the maps were produced. Um, and they were not very linear. They were, they were very much like a sort of um, a kind of embodying, mapping something and then disembodying it in a sense, you know, taking it apart um, and also taking it apart through different hands, um, the hands of the welder, the caster, um, and then reassembled 
by us. Uh, so I would, I, I, I don't know if I've, I don't think I've answered your question, but um, Wiseman's, um, you know, thinking of, of, of this verticality uh, and especially this idea of how um, the map is constructed um, through the colonial lens um, in regions of conflict um, and through the drone um, is, is really in, an interesting question because I, I mean, I, out of all of this, one of the things that came out for me was the optics, the optics of looking um, outwards, you know, whether it was through the binoculars, uh, whether it was through the archival report. Um, and I was kind of um, negotiating this, um, you know, the unevenness or the kind of, um, uh, the kind of um, way that I was trying to stitch together um, uh, ways of production, but also the kind of knowledge that, you know, we inherit and we reproduce and recycle. Um, but it's a question that I'm going to think about because um, it's it's definitely um, it's it's definitely a critique that we we've been kind of we're kind of looking at very closely, uh, especially when um, we're talking about geography and and territory and conflict. Thanks, Niza. Um, um, there's actually a proposal from Tazine Zahida, who'd like to collaborate with you, um, who's a playwright in Houston, and she'd like to collaborate with you for a play in Karachi um, in the light of environmental change. Um, the next question is actually, um, let's see, do you have any observations um, on the challenges faced by women artists in South Asia in general? and Pakistan in particular? Um, I think uh, contrary to what a lot of people may think, women artists are really at the forefront of very exciting and radical work um, and have been for more than a decade. Um, some of the most uh, important art educators uh, are women in different art institutions who've also been um, producing um, important work. Um, I think the challenge that women face um, is something which um, I think one of the challenges women face is, is, is probably this sort of, uh, sort of uh, the, the, the challenge of, 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 of um, balancing work and family life. I think that's something which is quite tough to do. Um, I've taught at the Indus Valley School of Art for many years and at Karachi University and observing the, the gender ratio, for example, there've always been more women in the fine art department, but they've always, um, it's always been, I mean, I don't think I can generalize, but it's often very tough to manage um, the professional career of, a, of, a, of an artist um, with the pressures of, of, of getting married and having children. And you know, once you do, um, you have to um, find a way to keep your gray matter together, you know, to, to, to maintain your intellectual focus um, through that process of, of, of being disconnected from your practice often for months and years. And I, I think that is really, um, from my experience, the biggest challenge. Um, and also from seeing how uh, female students, you know, cope with these uh, pressures. So I, I, I would say that is one, one thing. Um, Naisa, there's, I, I guess, a linked question um, from Ambreen Siddiqui, um, who would like to know if there are some important lessons from your career um, that you would like to share with emerging artists? Um, okay. Um, well, I would say that um, it's really important to keep working and 
also to not um, be too restless about the market because that is um, a space which is quite distracting to the production of your work. Um, it's tough because in Pakistan, we don't have a lot of alternative platforms. The art, um, art is developed within very much within the marketplace. And, and that can be fantastic for many artists who are producing and selling and exhibiting. But for others where the work is quite speculative and experimental, it can be really frustrating and fraught. And so you don't find audiences who will um, you know, support you financially, uh, intellectually, uh, and stay with your work. So I think um, the, the, the thing to do is to understand what kind of artist you are and what kind of work you want to produce and not to try and conform too much um, to the tight parameters you know, of, of, a, of a commercially driven uh, marketplace. Um, and also to, to generate platforms which are alternative. I mean, I feel that, um, you know, it's, it's not easy, but it's possible within very small resources to develop projects which, um, you know, that you can inhabit, that you can um, collectively produce with other artists and not just artists, but, you know, people from different disciplines that, that you, you, you work with um, and connect with. So I think that's, that's my advice, not to be too restless and to stay in the slow lane. Oh, I, I love that. I love that advice, um, Niza. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, Josie Brown would like to um, know if you can share more about your relationship with ready-made objects um, for the use of observations, such as the telescope in your Venice exhibition. Do you see more of these in your future work? Thank you, Josie. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, um, the telescope, the binoculars um, were very, um, it was the first time I'd used a found object really in my work. Um, and it was quite um, difficult to think about its position, um, you know, this, this kind of, because I don't work with found objects and I don't transform them. And I think, again, it comes back to the question of how do you internalize something uh, how much time do you spend with an object to make it your own? Uh, and, you know, that kind of self-critique of using something which you haven't manufactured or fabricated with your own hands. So I think that that was a kind of anxiety. Um, but then, um, in a sense, um, in the Venice project, it became very much uh, about um, bringing a piece of something that I'd experienced which I knew would, would change in meaning, um, you know, being transported from one geography to another, to Venice. Um, and, and, and sort of think about how uh, it could be, um, I, it could be performed. It could itself become a kind of performative um, piece which, um, um, which people could engage with. And, and so the, this idea of placing the films um, within the uh, within the, the the viewfinder of the telescope uh, was was something I wanted to do because um, I didn't want it to just be placed as an inert uh, static object um, and I was thinking about how you know on the beach in Menorah people go up to the telescope and they look through the through the binoculars and they kind of find this the the the, the horizon line and they look at the vessels out in the ocean and so I wanted you know, people to be able to um, to engage with the objects and, and to, to, to use it in some way. Um, and so I think in the future, I, I would like to think about, um, I would like to think about how this, this idea could evolve, but um, I'm not sure. I think you just have to kind of um, place yourself in a situation and then, um, yeah, find, find a way to, to make something happen. I like that idea. Um, Niza, if you don't mind, there's a question um, 
from Mudassar Malik um, about the South Asia Art Initiative. Is it okay if I if I just quickly address address it? So, um, uh, Mudassar Malik would like to know um, how the art initiative has helped in terms of uh, bridging the understanding of South Asia artists and the audience at Berkeley. Um, so, just briefly, um, I, I'd like to say that you know the, the art initiative uh, south asia art initiative was founded two years ago i think um when we realized that there was actually um four faculty members um at berkeley to an art practice my colleague alan de souza and myself and um to an art history um my uh, colleague atri gupta and shigata ray who all worked on south asia and um you know this is really unheard of at um, any educational institution, um, at least in the United States. And so it just made sense for us to um, form something um, that, um, um, you know, brought uh, uh, programming focus um, on the art and visual culture of South Asia. So some of the things that um, that we're, we're uh, looking to do and some things we've already done um, um, are um, programs such as uh, um, a residency um, that we'd like to host um, every other year. Um, you know, we have a, um, a lecture series um, and we've had, you can go to our website and see some of the part past uh, lectures that we've had. Um, we also do, um, we also grant um, an art prize and a dissertation prize um, to um, two young um, emerging, um, one artist and one scholar um, in the field, which has been really exciting. This is the first um, year that we will be um, 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 giving out that prize. So, so these are some of the things that we're uh, working on and um, let's see. Um, okay. um, There's a question from Christopher Kosia, whose um, podcast I also played briefly. Thanks, Chris, um, for your question. Um, so, actually, it um, my interest in indentured uh, indentureship um, began with. Um, Two things actually. It was the project that Celine Went uh, curated, the Sea is History at the Museum of the Natural, the, the 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 Museum in Oslo, which was looking at um, um, artists working with uh, the Caribbean specifically, and I guess um, I was interested because I was doing research on uh, the Riot Act. Um, and about how and in what situations the Riot Act, the British Riot Act had been read. Uh, and of course, one of the most famous examples is the Jagiyamala Bagh uh, in Amritsar, the Amritsar massacre in 1917, where the British um, uh, colonial forces read the Riot Act. And as I was researching this, I found um, an incident in, um, I think 1884 in the port of Spain um, there was um, a Muharram massacre. It's known as the Jose massacre. And um, this happened um, when um, the small Shia community within the indentured labor community, uh, you know, uh, community took out Tazias for the Muharram um, procession. And I guess what made me think, um, uh, you know, start doing research on this was, was really the fact that I imagined how, you know, uh, um, you know, a British colonial officer would be sitting on a horse reading out the Riot Act in a language that people didn't understand um, and in a space where it wouldn't be heard because there would be so much noise of people starting a procession or, you know, having a protest. Um, and it was this kind of very specific experience of thinking of how that riot act um, was probably spatialized in that specific moment that made me start to do research on the Jose massacre and then, um, you, know, for, you know, get further into this um, history of indentured labor. Um, 
but I think also it's for me been very much about the questions of the ocean and how the ocean becomes a space of transformation and you know um, how identities change as people travel as as refugees move across places so you know there's kind of this over over kind of larger question for me um, and then of course it was conversations with with Christopher Cozier that also um, you know was was so important because he was um, you know, we've been talking about this, and um, he's been sending images of 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 um, uh, Jose as it is currently um, um, takes place in, in in Trinidad. So yeah, number of different things. Um, so Naza, we're just at time, um, and maybe I could read um, a comment by Professor Ann Walsh, who's a, a, a faculty member in the art practice department. Um, Ann Walsh says that, thank you, Naza. I appreciate so much the movement between research, analysis, and imaging you do through materials and touch in your work. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and. Um, Naiza, thank you so much for um, for fielding questions for uh, such a long time, 45 minutes, I think. Um, we're, we're so grateful. Um, I think there's some... Uh, thank you very much, Asma. I'm going to hold up one of the maps which I have here in my studio. And it is uh, the, the brass map of Siliguri, which is um, near, kind of near Darjeeling, I think, but it's a... It's a it's a small location on the map, but I thought I would hold this up and show it to you. Thank you very much, Asma, and Punita, and everyone on your team. Thank you so much. Um, 